Hi everybody, this is Erin with Samuels Public Library, and because uh, this month is currently Pride Month, we have a local Virginia author here, Angel Petta, uh, and we are going to be showcasing uh, one of her books, The Artist and the Soldier. And we have a copy currently at the library, so if anybody's interested, please feel free to check it out. So Thank Angel, you. would you like to talk a little bit about the book? Yeah, absolutely. So it's historical fiction and it takes place around World War II. Um, it's the first piece of historical fiction I wrote. I've This is my first published book, but as, as many authors will say, I wrote um, four books before I published my first one because it takes a long time to, to get in there. So um, I was actually in Rome uh, visiting, which uh, was something that I'd always wanted to do. My family is from Italy and it was just um, really special for me to be there. And when we were there, we were touring this church and I was told this fantastical story about a movie that was made in Rome during World War II during the um, Nazi occupation of Rome. And this director of that was pretty famous at the time hired um, all these extras basically to be in the movie that were Jewish dissidents and people who were in hiding and so that they wouldn't be shipped off to the concentration camps and everybody lived in the church. And, you know, they said that they kept filming even when there was no film and the director basically said like no one's leaving until um, the occupation is over. And I just thought like, how do I not know this story? That's so incredible. So that same day I heard that I also happened to like uh, be on Facebook or something and saw an NPR article about camps that were run in America in the 1930s that were basically training camps for um, German American boys and girls in um, Nazi ideals and Nazi ideology. And again, I was like, that was happening in America, and, there, and I, once I started doing research, there were there were several um, camps that happened, like summer camps that happened o over the whole country. I sent mine in one in New York, and I just very quickly kind of connected these two events and knew that I wanted to set a story in which the beginning was in one of these summer camps, and then the ending ended somewhere at um, the Basilica with the filming of the uh the the movie and i didn't kind of know anything else except that and then the characters of max and bastion came to me very quickly i actually on my uh, way home on the plane i wrote like kind of an outline of of what i what i already knew from from the characters in the book and it was it was really interesting they when they came to me i knew right away they were gay i knew right away it was a love story I, you know, I'm sure writers will, will tell you, like, there, sometimes there isn't a rhyme or a reason for where a story comes from, and um, Elizabeth Gilbert talks in one of her talks about uh, that she believes stories are kind of just, like, given to us, and, and we can choose to write them or not write them, and she has this fascinating story, I won't recount the whole thing, but basically, if, like, she had an idea for a book, and she started researching it and everything, and then she got off track, and um, she was meeting with another author and uh, they basically were writing the exact same book. And, and Elizabeth Gilbert had let go of that book and like it was, you know, in the back of a drawer and she'd moved on to another book. And um, uh, that was really uh, magnified her idea that like there's, there's these stories floating around and, and if it comes to you, you can choose to have it or you can choose to let it go and someone else will write it. So I think for me with the artist and the soldier it was very much like that. Like I heard those two stories somewhere in my mind automatically connected them. I saw the characters and um, it just kind of went from there. Oh, that's so cool. And I definitely uh, understand that because like circle fiction has always been one of my favorite genres and it's like going to a place and just being like, oh my gosh, there's so much about stuff that we just don't know and it just kind of hits you. And yeah, so that, that is really cool that you went to Rome and like got to see all that stuff and, and learn new things. So uh, what was the, you said you were doing some recent more research on it, what was that kind of um, like to just kind of draw into everything? Yeah, so after I kind of wrote my initial story ideas, I spent about six months just doing research. So reading everything I could on the camps, on, um, you know, just uh, like social 
uh, functions and everything of the time in the 1930s in America. And then I did some research on um, Italy, but I wanted to write the first part uh, that's kind of separated into two parts. So I wanted to write the first part while I was really embedded in that um, history and that research. So I wrote that first part. Um, the writing itself didn't take that long. It was probably only a couple months to write the first hundred pages or so after I had done the research, because as um, probably people who do historical fiction will tell you, so much of the story, at least for me, came from the research. So things I learned were built into the story, big major plot points, especially in part two around things that are happening around the war and in the city became major plot points in, in the book that drove the action forward and allowed my characters to kind of um, have their growth and, and move through the story with, with those different events. So after the first part, I kind of repeated, I did research for another few months on Italy and the occupation and everything. And then I wrote the, the second half after that. That's awesome. Um, so what motivated you to be like become an author in general? <sighs> You know, I don't know if it was a motivation so much as just something that uh, was a foregone conclusion for me. When I was a kid, I loved reading. Um, I loved writing. I remember I was probably eight when I conceived of like my first uh, book series. It was like a children's book series based on this fictional dinosaur called Jacob. And I kind of modeled it because, you know, eight-year-olds don't have a lot of original thoughts probably, but like, well, that's not true. Eight-year-olds have a lot of original thoughts. I don't know if I did, but I kind of modeled it off of like the, the Berenstein Bears of like, like, so Jacob the dinosaur goes to the tennis. Jacob the dinosaur goes to summer camp. And I was very serious about it. I remember I had a friend who illustrated it. And I remember we would have like meetings and about like what was going to happen in the book and, and what he was supposed to be drawing. And, and I was very, very serious about this, this book series that I was going to um, create. So I, I don't know. It just, it was something that was always a part of me. And then I started writing my first novel, I think when I was um, 19. And then from there, I just, um, after I found the form of, of, of novel writing, before that, it was like short stories and poetry, and I loved it, but it just didn't, like, it didn't click until I wrote my first novel, and I'm like, this is, this is my form. I would much rather sit down and, and write a novel than a short story. Um, short stories, like, are so hard for me, <laughs> so <laughs> I very few of those, yeah. Uh, do you remember the first story that you ever read and how that impact on yeah you know I think the the first um book really that that impacted me was To Kill a Mockingbird and I probably read it in high school my high school English program was just so 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 a lot of the kind of classics I ended up reading on my own um and I actually have a, a dog named Atticus so that's how much I carry that story and I just, I remember being so moved by her work and her words and what she was able to portray. And then uh, shortly after that, I read um, Animal Farm and then 1984 by George Orwell. And both of those, the social commentary, which I don't even think I probably understood, but I read them in high school, but it was just, it was, and I've read both since multiple times, but I was just remember being really impacted by the the stories, by um, so I guess, and what they all have in common is really social commentary and, and looking at the way the world works. And, um, I'm, I'm working on another historical fiction book. I'm about halfway through, um, which takes place in like the 1960s. And, but I have a idea for a book after that, which is like a young adult series, I think that, uh, goes into that kind of, um, that social lens. So yeah, it's interesting. I'm like connecting things as I'm, I'm talking about it that I wonder if that like some of that is is affected by those beginning books that I really just fell in love with. Um, yeah. That sounds awesome. It's kind of cool seeing more books. Like I think um, we see a lot more coming out that's like different time periods that we don't normally see with historical fiction. So like 1960 sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited because it was a time when there was so much change and it um, the main character, the, I have two main female characters, which is also interesting as new for me. I, I typically write males, um, but uh, in the 
female character is a, a therapist who dies at the beginning of the story and I'm a therapist. So there's like some parallels that I, I'm able to write there. And then um, there's a, a woman detective who's investigating her death. And then the husband um, who's a journalist is in there as well. So it deals a lot with um, social implications of being a woman in the 1960s um, with, with race and definitely with mental health. Um, and how it was treated in the 1960s, but even, you know, I think it's also a commentary and reflection of how mental health is, is still treated today. There's definitely things that are left over, I think, unfortunately, from the beginning of how we treated people with, with um, mental health um, problems to how we treat them now. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Like I said, I'm about halfway through, so hope, I'm, I'm hoping to finish by the end of the summer. We'll definitely be looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. So... Before we end, was there anything else um, you want to talk about for the artist and the soldier? Um, no, only that I'll say uh, for anyone who is a, a writer um, that, you know, it's, it's not easy and you have to write for yourself and the um, book industry in, in a really beautiful way is flooded in that there are so many books written every single day and so many books published every single day. And now there are so many different ways to publish, which again is like such a beautiful way to open the playing field for, because if you look at the best-selling list, like it's basically the same people for the last, you know, 10, 15 years, except for, you know, one or two that kind of stand out or hang out for a little bit and then go away. So um, I would say for anyone like authors seeking advice that like write for yourself and, and don't tie your writing to an outcome. And um, for me with this book, like 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 1000 people, like it's, it's all equal and that um, it's all having an impact. And I'm just so happy for it to be out in the world. Yeah, this was awesome. Like I said, and um, I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list because, again, like I love historical fiction. I love World War II in general because, again, okay. that's I, I thought it was so cool that you're, you know, you're talking about like that, how we have camps here in the U.S. during that time that, I mean, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I know we had concentration camps, but like actual camps that was like. Right, know, right. For the Japanese. Yeah. I mean, it, it was so fascinating. I think so much history not necessarily swept under the rug, but it's often forgotten because there's yeah. so much and, and, um, in in for American history, like there's so much that happened in those hundred years, right? From like 1900 okay. to 2000, that um, it's so much is worthy of bringing forward into the light. So um, yeah, well, let me know what you think when you read of it. I I always love uh, feedback like and <laughs> um, and hearing what what people think and yeah. And thanks for for taking the time. I I like I said at the end, like. It's, it's so hard to be an author when you tie it to outcome because like if you're, especially if you, I mean, I fortunately in some ways, I'm not trying to make a living from it. I'm, I'm a therapist, I'm a, a graduate um, college professor. So I, and I love that. So I, I, I get to do things I love in multiple genres, but um, there are multiple, multiple realms, but um, it, I'm in a writer's group and it, it's hard. Like the, and these are talented people you know, who have, are doing amazing work in, in their books and who knows if half of them will ever be published. And if they are published, they'll ever be read because it is so saturated, but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Because that means there's more available, but also for, for authors, it makes it really hard to like, how do you get a foothold and how do you, so it's just, it's, it's, it's super interesting to me and yeah. Well, I like how you said, uh, you know, writing for yourself, because that's, I think that's the most important thing, like, um, yeah. that can get, I don't want to say taken aside, but like, you know, you can, you can tell, so I, I, well, I feel like there's some authors out there, I can tell, like, you're, they're, they're doing it more for the industry instead of, you know, getting their voice out there. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we're, we're also, we're very happy that we currently have your book in our collection, and again, that's The Artist and the Soldier. And we do have a copy here at the library, so feel free to come pick one up. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you.